There's a moment in Xenogears where the player's party enters a grisly futuristic factory called the Soylent System. This sequence is partly a reference to the 1973 film Soylent Green, starring Charlton Heston. But while Heston was a big star at the time, the film wasn't really much of a hit. It's about an overcrowded future in which the government creates a new food source from the remains of human bodies. And 25 years later, when Xenogears came out in the US, critics wondered why such an obscure movie reference would appear in a Japanese RPG. It's hard to overstate how different the perceptions of that movie are in Japan and in the West. So that voice you just heard is Patrick Holloman of the Game Design Forum. If you haven't read his reverse game design series, uh, it's an academic analysis of classic video games like Final Fantasy VII and Chrono Trigger, there are going to be links provided in the description. He's going to be joining me today to provide his expertise on Xenogears. Glad to be here. So, in Japan, Soylent Green is a foreign sci-fi flick that hardly anyone has ever seen. But because of that, it was kind of cool and niche. In America in 1998, however, Soylent Green was basically a meme. Most people only know the film from the one line that spoils the whole plot. Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell him, Soylent Green is people! And most people who played Xenogears didn't even know that line from the film itself. Many only knew it because Saturday Night Live parodied the film in the 90s, with Phil Hartman playing Heston's part. Silent White is made out of people! It's people! You can imagine how Western audiences of the 90s might have felt like this reference was a little bit strange for a video game. Strange and obscure references like that aren't only intended to construct a niche experience, one which certainly led to Xenogears' status as a cult classic. They're also essential to obtaining a complete understanding of the game's core theme. Xenogears' mythology was founded on the philosophies of Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Karen Horney, and was also greatly influenced by the work of Arthur C. Clarke. It's filled with reasonably accurate references to the Jewish Kabbalah, the ancient religion of Gnosticism, and even quantum mechanics, but while all of this culminated in a story that is fascinating from an intellectual perspective, it still begs the question, why did the writers want to base their game on these core ideas? What was it they were trying to say with Xenogears? For those of you who have seen my retrospective review of this game, you probably remember how the video opens up with the symbol of a broken mirror. That symbol is an important one for the game. It represents the shattered psychology of the main character. However, there's also another important piece of symbolism I failed to elaborate on in that video. These two angel figures, each having only one wing. It's this symbol which we'll be focusing on today. The symbol is first encountered early in the game, when the player visits Nysan, which serves as the headquarters for a major religious sect in the world of Xenogears. One of the leaders there explains that these figures are part of the religion's creation myth, which posits that in the beginning, God created man and woman, but left them incomplete. The only way for men and women to become whole is for them to depend on one another. And the player sees these figures again at another crucial moment in the story. As the party descends into the depths of the final dungeon, they slowly pass a much larger version of the same sculpture. The fact that this symbol appears near the beginning and the end of the story should signify how important it is. Right. In fact, that symbol doesn't only explain the origin of human beings in Xenogears, it actually explains the origin of the game itself. Xenogears was the creation of two Squaresoft employees, Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Tanaka. The two met at work and bonded over shared interests in philosophy, psychology, and religion. Eventually, they even got married, and somewhere along the way, they decided that they should write a story together. Takahashi said that he wanted to write about an assassin with multiple personalities. Tanaka said she wanted to write about a woman who gives birth to a new race of human beings. Those two ideas acted as the launching point for Xenogears, and somehow the final script had to get from the birth of a new mankind to the life of a dissociative killer. They also wanted to put their other shared interests into the story. It had to include ideas from Jewish mystical tradition, Freudian psychoanalysis, Jungian psychology, Gnostic teachings, Nietzschean philosophy, and abundant references to science fiction classics like Childhood's End and Soylent Green. However, the most important thing to note is that Takahashi and Tanaka knew they wanted all of this in the story before they began writing. When it was time to devise the plot, the process worked a lot like a puzzle, except 
they didn't know what the finished portrait should even look like. Working under such constraints forced them to be creative, and if you've ever wondered why the plot of Xenogears is so original and oftentimes confusing, these constraints played a large role in that. Step one in assembling the puzzle of Xenogears plot was for Takahashi and Tanaka to figure out what all of those interests had in common. What theme do Freudian and Jungian psychology, Gnosticism, and the Kabbalah all share? The connection that Takahashi and Tanaka made is that all these schools of thought claim to provide a path towards becoming whole, either in a spiritual or a psychological sense. Now, I want to state up front that we don't pretend to be experts on Freud or Jung or the Kabbalah. We're just going to look at Xenogear's interpretation of these ideas as they show up in the game. And in doing that, we're actually going to break down Xenogear's plot into all its individual conflicts. There are a lot of them, but each one gives us a different look at the theme of becoming whole. So if you were ever confused about what exactly is going on in the game, this section will hopefully clear that up for you. But be warned, there are a lot of spoilers coming up. So the full backstory of Xenogears is spread across both the game and its companion book, Perfect Works. That story takes place over an insane amount of time. And to try to make sense of it, we've arranged the conflicts by the time scale on which they occur. For example, the biggest underlying conflict in the story takes place on a timescale of 10,000 years. In this branch of the story, scientists of a future civilization created the Zohar Modifier, a source of unlimited energy. They installed the Zohar Modifier into an interplanetary war machine called Deus. When the Zohar Modifier was turned on, it connected to a higher dimension and absorbed a being known as the Wave Existence. The Wave Existence is essentially a part of God as he exists in the Xenogears universe. After this happened, Deus became self-aware and rebelled against its creators. Deus' final attack is what we see in the opening cinematic of the game. As a last-ditch attempt to destroy the weapon system and save humanity, the captain of the ship which holds Deus' body activates the self-destruct, blowing Deus to pieces. Over the next 10,000 years, the Deus system tries to become whole by growing and absorbing new biological parts, which are the humans, demi-humans, and monsters that populate the planet. This storyline is a science fiction retelling of the ancient religion of Gnosticism. In the theology of Gnosticism, or at least the parts of it that appear in Xenogears, the material universe is an imperfect place created by accident. An emanation from the spiritual universe entered the material universe as the Demiurge, or an imperfect god of the physical world. The wave existence represents the benign spiritual god, while Deus, who holds the wave existence captive and uses it as a power source, represents the corrupt Demiurge. The Wave Existence wants to become whole again by returning to the rest of himself in a higher dimension. Deus wants to become whole by consuming all life on the planet to serve as replacement parts for its body. The conflict between Deus and the Wave Existence drives everything else in the game. Not every conflict takes place on this kind of cosmic scale, though. Some of them take place over the course of a single human life. The main character of Xenogears, Fei Fang Wang, was horrifically abused as a child and witnessed the death of his mother firsthand. This trauma eventually results in the fracturing of his mind into three separate personalities. One of these is a child frozen in its own mind, the second is the character that the player controls, and the third is a bloodthirsty assassin called Id, whose only pleasure in life is to fight and kill. These three personalities are a science fiction interpretation of Freudian psychology. According to Freud, the human mind is divided into three parts, the ego, superego, and id. In Fey, these parts each become a personality, and Fey's character arc sees his superego struggle with the id for control over his body. This conflict is eventually resolved after his encounter with his father and the wave existence. His personalities become merged into one whole person. The use of Freud's ideas also emerges several times by way of important character names. Fey's alternate personality, id, is named for Freud's term for the base animal impulses all humans possess. In one of Faye's past lives, his name was Lacan, as in Jacques Lacan, a second-generation Freudian thinker whose work explains this character's transformation into Graf. Faye's mother, Karen, is named after another Freudian scholar, Karen Horney, who wrote extensively about childhood trauma and how it affects psychological development. In the story, a possessed Karen Wong is the person who inflicted horrific childhood trauma on Fei. Between these two extremes, there are several other storylines and conflicts 
that operate on different timescales. For example, Faye and Ellie are reincarnated and meet each other across the course of several human lifetimes. In every lifetime, they fall in love, including the lifetime they experience in the playable part of the game. This love story is really important for the structure of the narrative. With all these gargantuan sci-fi concepts and conflicts within conflicts, the love story between Faye and Ellie gives the plot a human dimension. It also gives the player a personal stake in the outcome of the plot. Saving the world and helping a part of God escape to a higher dimension is great, but it has a lot more impact because the player is also saving Ellie at the same time. This storyline is also derived from the game's original constraints. In the plot, Ellie was created by the Wave Existence as a perfect companion for Faye. This mirrors the story of Adam and Eve from the Old Testament, in which Eve was created as the perfect companion for Adam in Paradise. She is a complementary being that made Adam whole. In fact, Xenogears borrows quite a bit from the Old Testament and the Jewish commentaries on it. Faye's original identity, Abel, is straight out of the Old Testament, as is the name of Emperor Cain. The major settlements of the world, like Ava, Kislev, and Shavat, are named after the Hebrew months. The powerful Zohar modifier is taken from a mystical commentary on the Bible called the Zohar. Various other objects and systems that appear in the game, like the Katamoni system, Geshia Key, and Merkaba, are taken straight from the Bible, Kabbalah, and Hebrew legends. The idea of the male and female halves of a person becoming whole in one another also appears in the writings of Carl Jung. He wrote extensively about the male animus and female anima, essences which exist in everyone. According to him, each person must accept and develop both the male and female aspects of their own psychology in order to become a complete, mature person. Jung's actual theory is a lot more complicated than that, but we're only looking at how Xenogears takes the idea and puts it into the plot. During the second half of the game, the party spends several quests pursuing the anima relics, which align with their gears, making them vastly more powerful, a striking example of Jungian philosophy. A slightly more meaningful example might be Ellie's speech, explaining that her relationship with Faye is what gives her the strength to be the new leader of the Nissan sect. In fact, in one of Ellie's past lives, she was called Sophia, which is the name Jung used for the highest form of the anima. The rest of the conflicts in the game, which aren't quite as symbolically meaningful, are still built on the theme of becoming whole. This is particularly true of villains. After coming into contact with the Zohar, Lacan was split from his body, spending the next 500 years possessing the bodies of others, waiting for his next reincarnation to be born so that he could become whole by taking that body back. The Gazelle Ministry, the giant orb of talking heads, is also trying to become whole by returning to their original bodies. They were each destroyed 500 years ago when Graf went to war with Solaris, and their first plan was called the M Project, which involved building gears like Akzen and Zibzen, which they could use to transfer their consciousness. That plan is set aside when they capture Billy, Rico, and Bart, whose bodies and powers are similar enough to their own to allow direct transfer. A few other conflicts go the same way. In order to finish rebuilding the Deus system, Miang has to become one with Ellie, who is the other half of her original form. In order to open the ancestral Fatima tomb and some of the doors within Fort Jasper, Bart needs someone else with the Fatima family retinal pattern to complete his missing eye. This can only be done either by Margie or Sigurd, the people who become his family. Then there's the case of Krellian, the game's final villain, who believes he's so damaged and beyond redemption that he has no choice but to literally become one with God. Xenogears is, to me, one of the best examples in video games of the power and purpose of effective storytelling. At the heart of any story should be a message, something important the writer is trying to say, and that theme should inform every choice made throughout the entirety of the work. Each scene should be providing context to that message, setting the audience up for an emotional payoff. Xenogears accomplishes this with subtlety and brilliance, and despite the fact that the majority of the audience had little to no familiarity with many of the references Takahashi and Tanaka were drawing inspiration from, most of us still felt the impact of that message intuitively. The reason for this is because it's part of the human experience to feel broken and incomplete, searching for the peace of mind that comes through finding a psychological or spiritual sense of fulfillment. The fact that Takahashi and Tanaka were able to communicate that, despite their audience's general lack of awareness regarding these higher concepts, speaks to their finesse and artistic touch as storytellers. 
It's honestly inspiring stuff. I love the plot of Xenogears. It's occasionally convoluted, but the creators clearly had a plan for where they wanted to go. And they really do deliver on all the promises they make at the beginning. But as I've gotten older, it's the underlying message of Xenogears that has impressed me more and more. Takahashi and Tanaka are able to make an original and meaningful comparison between different religions and schools of psychology. And the conclusion they come to, that all these different philosophies and religious beliefs are really just different paths to becoming whole, is as profound a message as I've seen in any game. Just want to say thanks again to Patrick Holloman for coming on and helping me out with this video. If you've not read his reverse design series, links for that will be in the description. You can also click on this video here on the left to check out his YouTube channel. And if you'd like to see my full retrospective review on Xenogears, click on this video on the right.